Hey there, welcome to my presentation about Spoon. This is a version as of 24 February 2012. Um, the full version of this is probably about an hour. We'll see how it turns out. Okay, and also I should mention I'm using Prezi to make these slides here. Um, I think it's pretty cool. It's a zooming slide interface. So, what is Spoon? Well, uh, Smalltalk was originally designed to make individual people extremely powerful. And I think along the way, some features that are vital for working in teams got left behind. And in a sense, you can consider uh, the end user as part of a team when you're deploying. Um, not a whole lot of thought was put into how to deploy uh, applications. And that makes sense because it started off in a research environment. Um, in which you know all the users of applications uh, were also you know extreme power users themselves. Um, so I want to improve that, and then also once a Smalltalk app is uh, out in the world, I want to improve the infrastructure for that a, a person would use to find an application and actually install it and use it. So Spoon's a minimal and modular Smalltalk system. Um, and I want to do that so that uh, Smalltalk is uh, easier to teach because there isn't a lot of extraneous stuff uh, getting in the way, um, confusing uh, newcomers as to what's really important and what's less important. And you know what actually works and what is a, you know, a, an abandoned experiment. Um, and I also want to make it easier to compose a system that has exactly what you want in it. Um, both so that uh, what you're shipping is as clean as can be, um, and also so that um, people looking at the code later are, you know, can pick it up as easily as possible and learn what's going on. So I've made an object memory that contains only what's needed to resume the system and provide module services for loading more code. Here's a visualization of the very smallest memory I've made so far. Um, it's actually like a thousand bytes, but I padded it out at the end. You can see there at the lower right corner of the picture, this, that black there is uh, more padding. Um, now this image just uh, adds three and four and then quits. Uh, so it's extremely small. And you can't uh, really use it to, to build upon to make a more powerful system, like a system you could use for development. This was just an experiment uh, I did to see, you know, what's the absolutely smallest image I could make. And it's a simple example of an application-specific object memory. Um, it only does you know, one particular application. And you could imagine other um, applications as well, um, you know, something more complicated like a, a web server, um, being uh, in a form like this where it just does um, what the application needs to do and doesn't support, uh, you know, becoming a development system again. And I made it through a combination of techniques. Um, there's remote browsing, uh, linear inspection, and reference inspection. For remote browsing, I uh, implemented a remote messaging system and then uh, enhanced some of the traditional tools, the system browser, the debugger, and the inspectors, so that I could uh, browse uh, remote objects. And actually how I started this project was by doing that and removing things manually through uh, through those tools. And I got a long way with that, um, but realized later actually that there's a, a much more powerful technique for um, making a, a very small image, and that's to make a, a special version of the garbage collector that will treat as garbage every method in the system that hasn't been run since a certain point in time. Uh, when you do that, you end up 
also removing a lot of classes that get mentioned in the method literals of those methods. And then you can remove the methods of those classes, and then you, know, you sort of start over. Uh, in the literals of those methods in those classes, there are other classes mentioned. It sort of starts a chain reaction. Um, so that's actually the first, the, the best way to start first to make a really small memory is by uh, a specialized garbage collection. And then a tool like this system browser is good to come in and clean some things manually. But once a system has gotten pretty small, um, knowing what to go after is a little trickier. There's not a lot of low-hanging fruit anymore. Um, so I have a couple of visualization tools that help with that. Um, this is a linear object memory inspector. Um, it's just showing uh, the entire object memory uh, as a, a 2D picture. Um, so like over here um, is, you know, uh, byte zero and down here is uh, the end of object memory. And I've uh, used red pixels to indicate the, the start of each object and then I've uh, color-coded uh, the bodies of each object depending on what it is. Uh, blue, for example, here are compiled methods. And up here is a, a magnified view of what your cursor is uh, pointing at. Um, so you can get a better view. And you can actually click on any byte uh, in the whole object memory. And in the transcript here, um, you'll get uh, an explanation of what that object is according to the simulator. Um, this whole thing was done um, as sort of an extension to the simulator. There's a, a virtual machine simulator underlying all of this. Um, so this is one you know simple but powerful visualization. You can you can look at objects here and go after the big ones and find out what they are and then usually you can go in with remote tools and find that thing and um, you know, nil it out or remove all the references to it. Um, and then the last technique I used, um, I'm sort of talking over myself here because this YouTube movie has a, a voiceover as well, but um, I also implemented a um, 3D visualizer. This is using the Walrus uh, hyperbolic graph visualizer. I was able to get the simulator to uh, put output um, a walrus file um, that includes a, a spanning tree, uh, that's the, the blue graph, that passes through all the objects uh, once and only once. And then those white lines are uh, object references. And you can uh, point at any object, uh, a yellow dot there, and put it in the center and then get uh, a little one-line description of what that thing is. And if you're already somewhat familiar with uh, Smalltalk object memory, you can actually find your way around uh, familiar objects pretty quickly. And uh, this is sort of another way, in addition to the linear visualization, of finding things that are probably not needed that you can then go in and kill with remote tools or through direct manipulation of uh, an object memory while being run by the simulator. That's another powerful technique. Okay, so once I've got this uh, minimal object memory, um, I want a way of um, loading uh, code to build it back up to systems which do useful things. Um, and also a way to unload that stuff later to make the system, you know, as small as it used to be. Um, I'm hoping that no one ever has to do any um, image stripping again because the module system will be powerful enough that you can remove anything that you've added. And your starting point is sufficiently small for any, what any development team would, would want to do. If you want to get, you know, even smaller than that to do an application specific image like that 3 plus 4 thing, then you can, you know, do the equivalent of stripping again, but hopefully that will be rare. Um, and by the way, uh, what I call stripping here um, is uh, referred to as dissolve or dissolving. Um, 
because I'm sort of finding all the things in the in the system which all the methods in the system which aren't actually contributing to any functionality and turning them into garbage. So it sort of feels to me like a I'm yeah dissolving uh, everything that doesn't look like a sculpture from a, a block of marble, for example. So a bit more about the history system. Um, I have a, an object model that uh, describes all the behavior-related artifacts in a system, uh, and they're called additions. Every addition is uh, linked to a previous addition and a next addition, has an author, a license, and a timestamp. And this is uh, the abstract superclass of all the additions in the system. Um, most all editions uh, are commented as well, so they have a, a comment edition. And most of those are also tagged and have an active uh, tags edition. And tags are useful for, uh, you'll, you will see later, for the discovery process for finding things uh, through Google, uh, especially modules. We also have a model for authors. Now here are the things that relate to behavior specifically, uh, classes and methods. And every behavioral edition has a, an ID. And we'll see later that uh, IDs are basically just byte arrays that you can use to uniquely identify any uh, class or method in the system, any version of any class or method in the system, even ones that have been removed. So these IDs are uh, yeah, basically just byte arrays with a particular interpretation of their contents. So every class ID has a base ID, which is just a UUID, a version, which is um, two bytes, and an author ID. Method IDs uh, elaborate that structure with a method author ID and another two bytes of method version. It's actually 15 bits, as we'll see later, but um, it's a pretty big space. So this means that every um, class uh, can have uh, 16 bits worth of versions by each author. And every method in every version of each class can have uh, 15 bits of version for each author. So if you think about that for a little bit, you realize that's pretty humongous. And this also enables um, being able to use the history system to version arbitrary objects in the system, not just methods, by uh, using those arbitrary objects as uh, literals in compiled methods. Uh, hopefully we'll look at that a bit more later. So the last bit part of a method ID is the method selector, and that's a variable length. It just goes uh, from one point in, in the middle of the method ID until the end. So uh, class and method additions are basically blueprints of classes and methods that are all binary, um, but can be used by a system to reconstruct a class or method uh, as it was in the system from which it came. And uh, we can do this because we're not referring to uh, classes by name. Um, as long as we have the base ID of a class, then we know uh, the, that class's identity. And that's the big idea behind uh, NIAD, uh, Spoon's history system is that it preserves uh, object identity in the, between the system where something comes from and where it's installed. So 
you can transfer compiled methods directly. You don't have to worry about recompiling methods from source code, which is ambiguous. So you don't have to worry about the compilation environment of a receiving system in which you're going to install something. And we'll talk more about this uh, later on as well. So you can see here some more familiar things uh, about uh, what I call proto-classes, the counterpart to meta-classes. It's just uh, like a normal class. Class object would be a proto-class, and its meta-class would be object class. So now we'll get to sort of the, the magic that makes method additions work, that let you install compiled methods directly. And that's uh, literal markers. Literal markers are blueprints for reconstructing compiled method literals. And so there's one for every kind of uh, compiled method literal that there can be. Uh, those that refer to classes, uh, those are used, um, the, the kind that are used when there are uh, sends to super in a method. Um, pool variables, calling them published variables now. Um, and class variables, um, globals, that's backward compatibility for system dictionaries. Although Spoon itself doesn't have a system dictionary. We don't need one because we can just ask each class for its name. In, uh, in Spoon, every class is responsible for its own name. So all of these literal markers know how to uh, store themselves on a proxy stream. And basically, uh, in this remote messaging system, which is called other, there's a, um, a bunch of tags, one for each uh, class in the system that the message, remote messaging system knows about. And then, you know, each of these uh, blueprints, either additions or literal markers, uh, can then uh, store itself in binary form on, on a stream. If you want to dig into the remote messaging system, a good place to start is in messaging session. So, you know, there are all these tags for different uh, special classes in the system that uh, other knows about. And there's also uh, a special uh, affordance for uh, transmitting uh, proxies through remote messages and uh, small integers. as well as uh, yeah, some objects uh, that just transmitting the tag is enough to indicate what the object is, like true, false, and nil. Yeah, so it's basically um, the, the literal classes like uh, symbol, string, and float, things like that, and the classes that are part of the history system, like the manifest classes and the license classes and the addition classes, those are the, the ones that are known specially to the remote messaging system by having their own uh, tags. I imagine this scheme will get extended over time as well. So literal markers are uh, what make method additions uh, work. And we say that when we uh, transfer a method addition from one system to another and install it, we're imprinting the method that that method addition describes. Now, a module addition is basically just a collection of uh, method IDs. 
Remember, uh, a method ID identifies a particular version of a method that can be installed in a particular version of a class. So we say that uh, when you imprint a module, you're creating a, an empty module in the receiving system, and then uh, a module of interest that you want to install in the providing system speaks directly with that new module you've created, and the two of them synchronize their enclosing systems with each other. That's what imprinting a module means. So, some more stuff that I had to do to make imprinting work um, included some virtual machine support. And it's, you know, basically comes down to changing how method lookup works. Uh, this is the, the heart of support for other, the remote messaging system. Um, I have a, a special uh, class in the system um, which is known by identity to the VM through the special objects array. Um, and this class is actually called Other. You can uh, browse it. Um, if, basically, if the receiver is an instance of that proxy class, then we're going to forward um, this message on over the network to the object for which uh, the receiver is actually a proxy. So we see here that uh, instead of uh, sending the actual message that was sent, uh, we send uh, forward instead using the message that was originally sent as, uh, as a parameter. And here's that message, that forwarding logic. And I'll leave it to you to uh, look at the rest of what actually happens there when you're uh, forwarding messages. Uh, yeah, so we've already talked about method literal markers. So now um, we've looked a bit at the history system object model, um, but something that I don't really talk about in the slides yet is how that is the basis for, for the actual history system. The important thing to look at there is a class called edit history. So edit history is basically a, a big um, history, an in-memory history database. And edit history keeps a collection of all the active module additions in the system and a collection of additions for every class that's active in the system. That's the, the main, the most important stuff it's holding on to. It also has a notion of a current author and some other things. Um, so these active class additions each one of those holds on to an addition for every method that's currently active uh, in the class. And remember, each addition can point to a previous addition and a next addition. So uh, you've got you know, a very uh, rich tree of additions describing all the classes and methods in the system and every version of every one. Um, so if you add a new method, then you're making a reference uh, to the next edition slot of the method edition for the previously active uh, version of that method, if there, if there was one. And when you remove methods and classes, you still have these additions hanging around in your edit history, so that if you want to, you can go and reinstall things in your system from your edit history. Now, where your edit history lives is actually in a completely separate object memory. That's what the history uh, memory is for. And I refer to the 
object memory artifacts being described by the history as the subject object memory. So you'll see two object memories in the release, uh, one called subject and one called history. And they start out both as minimal images, except for the history memory has a bunch of additions that describe everything in the subject memory. So now, great, you've got, you know, basically each developer with their own pair of object memories, a subject and a history, and each pair can speak with uh, all the other development systems on the net live. And this is a great way of exchanging behavior. But how do you figure out what module additions there are uh, in this uh, cloud of development systems uh, so that you can establish contact with one and um, imprint uh, someone else's modules onto your system? Um, I've come up with a system that um, leverages Google Search to be able to uh, look for um, modules in live history systems on the net that you might want to uh, imprint, that you might want to synchronize with. Um, and right now I encourage everyone to read uh, this page here, um, netgen.org slash spoon slash modules. I describe a bit of that. And let's just go look at that. Oh, I'm also available for uh, consulting uh, right now. I'm looking for new clients. Please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. So I imagine for every NIDE module, there's going to be a web page describing it. Um, and so we can give Google something to crawl. And since we're dealing with uh, UUIDs, um, we have unique things on these web pages um, that will make uh, searching uh, pretty easy and accurate. So let's look at one of these module pages. So here's a, a module for the uh, a fundamental, a set of fundamental constants: uh, true, false, nil, and the instances of the character class. So this just summarizes, you know, some of that information we saw in the module edition class: uh, the author, the license, a description, uh, timestamp, and tags, and also prerequisites. Now this I this is a UUID of a prerequisite module, and the page also includes uh, UUIDs. Um, that are related to the module. Um, the base ID of this module, and the UUID of the author, and of the license. And so these are all things that we can uh, search on in Google. Um, by connecting these uh, module pages together um, with uh, links. And we can actually install it by including an installation link and this is a, a specially encoded uh, link. When you follow it, it actually uh, speaks to a, a web server that's uh, running in your local system that knows how to go out and talk to other uh, spoon systems that uh, are connected to the net. So now if we you know, want to look for fundamental constants. I've made a Google custom search widget embedded into this web page. That we can use to uh, search all these module pages. So here we are. And then we could install it too by clicking that link. So I've uh, defined the first uh, set of modules uh, for the minimal system. If you look at my blog, there's a page that talks about it. Um, so here I summarize, you know, basically what that um, minimal development image does. And I list, you know, specifically what all the modules, classes, and methods are in that system. So here's that fundamental constants module that we were just looking at. 
and you can browse all the the rest of the modules. So I've been waiting for this for a long time. I think this is sort of the the bare minimum that you need to, in a system that you can extend and do development with. And also on this on my blog, um, there's another version of that embedded search for NIAID modules. So the yeah the, the module infrastructure itself is 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 live objects but we're using a very well known search mechanism um, to be able to search the metadata and give ourselves an entry point into that live system so that's the presentation as it is now i'm going to probably go into a lot more detail um, in future versions so if there's something that you'd like to know more about that you think I should go into more detail about, please do let me know. Um, and thanks for watching.